Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. I'm your host, Karem Mamutlu. And on today's show, we have Dr. Mark Farber, who's the editor-publisher of the Gloom, Boom and Doom Report. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you very much for having me. I'd like to start by talking about the growing popularity of modern monetary theory and the current environment we have for negative bond yields. Is MMT just another way of trying to keep certain inflated assets inflated? And if that is the case, how could investors take advantage of this potentially? What's your view, Mark? Well, my view is that we had already very modern monetary theories since, uh, as of today, uh, almost $15 trillion worth of bonds have negative interest rates. This has never happened in the history of mankind that interest rates were negative in nominal terms. Sometimes they were negative in real terms, but not in nominal terms. And so we are already testing new ways to inflate essentially the global economy and keep the system uh, from falling apart. In the process, we may have actually uh, accelerated the decline of banks because at negative interest rates, it's very difficult for them to make uh, a profit, especially in Europe. But under Q1, in other words, quantitative easing, and they then print money and pay for that money, purchases of bonds and equities with a, by sending a check to the respective financial institutions. In other words, uh, the ECB buys bonds uh, from an insurance company in Europe or from a pension fund or from a wealthy individual. They will pay with a check and so they expand the balance sheet. And the recipient is a financial institution usually. The financial institution does not consume. It will go and invest that money, and it, it may invest in Europe, in the case of the ECB, or it may invest in the United States, in equities or in commodities or private equity, in anything. You, you understand? So the money is not evenly distributed. Now, the MMT, as proposed by some people, would be for the government to spend the money. Essentially, uh, we would, could also call it helicopter money. You send a check to say, oh, everybody in your system, to every citizen, and the check is say one thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, whatever, uh, and that is financed uh, by the tr the treasury would send out these checks, but it's financed by the central bank, in the case of the U.S., the Federal Reserve, or the ECB. And that money does not flow into the system through the financial system, but directly through individuals. But, of course, uh, it has some negative <laughs> consequences in the long run, uh, in both cases of this balance sheet expansion and of MMT, uh, the role of the government increases, it becomes bigger and bigger, and uh, you essentially move into a direction of uh, dependency as a citizen from the government's benevolence. And uh, that implies that you will also lose your freedom. So the more government you have, the less freedom. Uh, that is in essence uh, where it can lead to. Let's talk about when you first started working on Wall Street in the 1970s, Mark. And was it possible to act as a contrarian thinker when being so close to a financial environment like Wall Street? Well, I think that the big difference between the 70s and today is that in the 70s, uh, the markets were still very small compared to the economy say, uh, the stock market capitalization in the U.S. as a percent of the economy was uh, between 20 and 30 percent in the 70s, and now it's 150 percent. You can see that at the time, uh, the market, the financial market, didn't have a huge influence on real economic activities. It was the other way around. 
Nowadays, if the stock market drops 20%, for sure you'll have a recession. So uh, the roles have changed a bit. Number two, I think that uh, in the 70s, uh, the, in, the dominant investors were financial institutions, pension funds, uh, trust accounts of big banks, insurance companies, and so forth. And uh, they, as today, by the way, uh, bought the same stocks. In the U.S., they call them the Nifty 50s. These are these were around 50 stocks that were essentially uh, called the quality growth stocks. Xerox, <laughs> Polaroid, uh, Eastern Kodak, Sears, J.C. Penney, Kresge, all the ones that are today bankrupt, they were at the time the quality growth stocks. And uh, the hedge funds in the 70s performed superbly because they took big bets, big contrarian bets against these huge institutions that owned all these shares. They took the view that these institutions would have to diversify and that these shares that were selling at roughly 50 times earnings would have to come down in value. So the 70s was the golden era of uh, hedge funds. And of course, in the 70s, a good day on Wall Street uh, was 12 million shares uh, trading a day. Uh, so it was much inferior and the Dow Jones had reached uh, the first time the 1000 mark in 1966. And then he traded largely sideways uh, between, say, 600 and 1,000 until 1982. So for the first big high was 60, uh, 1964 until 82. We're talking about 18 years of sideways movement. But there were lots of, there was a lot of volatility in individual sectors. And uh, notable in the 70s was obviously the rise in gold prices, silver prices, oil and so forth. So it was a boom time for commodity producers and uh, oil and oil related shares. Let's move on to today then. And are we back in a bull market for the precious metals sector? Has this breakout from the $1,300 to $1,400 area in gold surprised you? And is this something you've been waiting for, Mark, as most mainstream financial commentators have simply ignored the precious metal space until very recently? Yes, that is correct. Uh, precious metals were very popular at the end of the 1970s when old gold went to 850 and the enthusiasm for gold died down very slowly. And uh, by 1999, uh, 2000, it was a neglected asset class. And uh, even uh, after 2000, it wasn't very popular until about 2004, 2005, when it started to take off. And then... We made a peak in 2011 uh, at $1,921. And after that, we went down to around uh, $1,000 in uh, 2015. The low was in December 2015. And after that, we started to rise again. And yes, there has been a breakout above the 1350 level. Uh, which is important, and now we're above 1,400. So it's likely that gold is uh, again in a rising trend. To what extent it will go up, we don't know. Uh, I think if I look at everything, I don't think that gold is terribly expensive compared to negative yielding bonds, and to the size of the capital market and so forth. So I think we can probably still go up. If you ask me 
how do you look at the gold market breakout? Uh, of course, it was a genuine breakout, but the gold price should hold now above 1400 But I always advised all my friends, all my clients, and I do it for myself, uh, own some gold as an insurance policy. And depending on your level of confidence in the system or apprehension towards the financial authorities, uh, you want to have a larger or smaller percentage of your assets in gold. I happen to have a fairly large percentage. It, gold is my single largest position. I have more shares than I have gold. I have more bonds than I have gold. But these are diversified share portfolios, whereas gold is a single holding in one commodity or one precious metal. OK, let's talk about technology and how new technologies can disrupt old models. As an investor with a very successful long track record, it'd be interesting to know how you have taken advantage from investing in new technologies or trends. For example, what are your views on electric vehicles and the commodities that are needed for the batteries and the electrification infrastructure for today? And are electric vehicles a new disruption that investors should pay attention to? Yes, they are always uh disruptive new technologies. I mean, you take the railroad, that was probably the most dramatic invention in the last 2,000 years, because when you think about it, at the time of the Romans, uh, people uh, moved from A to B, they had to walk or on horse carriages, and uh, at the time of Napoleon, they moved at the same speed. Actually, they probably moved at the slower speed because the roads were not as good uh, in 1800 than they had been at the time of the Romans. So there, has, there was no progress in the mode of transportation. As to with railroads, you could ship people at, say, initially 50 miles an hour and later at higher speeds from A to B. So it meant uh, mass deportation became possible. People could live in the suburbs and then work in the cities. Uh, you could uh, build or assemble goods in city A on the East Coast and ship them to the South or ship them to the West Coast by train, which was efficient and so forth. So that was a huge disruptive technology, and it essentially pushed aside, to a large extent, the coach industry. The automobile was another huge invention that had an incredible impact on mankind in the sense that people could live in suburbs and uh, then drive to work uh, in the city and so that changed the economic landscape of the world. And uh, so we constantly have new inventions. The telegraph was one. The Suez Canal was another disruptive technology and so forth and so on. And lately, the Internet, I mean, we don't know yet for sure, but it could have a long lasting, deep impact the way people live. You take me. Initially, I worked on Wall Street. Then I worked for a year in Switzerland. And then since 73, I was in Hong Kong. Uh, in those days, you had to be, in order to carry out your business, in some kind of a financial center because you needed the equipment. You had to ship the script, the share certificates from A to B and back to A. You have to sign papers all the time and so forth. And uh, in Hong Kong, we even printed our own newsletter every day, every day, because we didn't have the Wall Street Journal, we didn't have the Herald Tribune, we had uh, not even Bloomberg, we had writers, but the only very few people had writers because it was expensive. And so for people to get the quotes, they had to be actually received from New York by Telex, and print it in the early morning in Hong Kong, and then send to the clients and so forth. 
So it's a totally different thing. Now, I can do my business from anywhere. I happen to live in Chiang Mai in the north of Thailand, but I could also do my business out of a hotel room or wherever I travel. What I need is the internet. That is a condition. Uh, without the internet, it is possible through the faxes, but it's more complicated. So the internet has had a huge impact on the world. And what it may also do, when you think of it, I mean, an employee, he lives in the suburbs. He travels for an hour to a city center, works in an office after an hour's traveling, <laughs> and then at five, six o'clock, he packs his bag, goes to the pub, and then travels another hour back home. It's a completely inefficient way to work. Far more efficient would be to say to your employees, well, you don't need to come to the office. You can work from your house. You can install in one of your rooms a small office. And we do everything through computers, paperless. And once a week, I will waste your time and organize a meeting in the city. Because most meetings are a complete waste of time. So the way city centers and cities are, the character may change dramatically. Maybe offices such as we know nowadays, where on one floor you have a few hundred people <laughs> working, maybe they will, will disappear. And that has a huge impact on real estate. You know, it's like the internet, Amazon has disrupted a lot of retailers. A lot of retailers will disappear. And only the best run ones will survive. But uh, what I wanted to say is possible that real estate in city centers uh, may not be the best investment because people will live in suburbs and they may not even go out. They may stay home. They may get food deliveries to their homes. Uh, they may eat at home, they may drink at home. It creates potentially a very different society than we had. And I see it today when I go to bars, pubs. My generation was a generation of heavy drinkers, <laughs> the boomers. And the young, the millennials and the generation Z, they drink much more. They're not interested to go to a pub. Uh, if they want to meet the girl, they can do it uh, online. So throughout your career, Mark, it would be interesting to know how you look for undervalued assets. Is it easier to find undervalued assets today than, say, 10 or 20 years ago? I think because of the Internet, uh, we also have a really a lot of information that is accessible to everybody. So... If someone is interested in the financial market, he can inform himself. However, I'd like to emphasize here that you asked me earlier what was Wall Street like in 1970, in the 1970s. At that time, there was one big market, the U.S. market. IBM alone was larger in terms of market capitalization than the entire Japanese market. And Asian markets like India uh, didn't, uh, India existed, but foreigners could really not buy equities in India. This was impossible. And Indonesia didn't exist, China didn't exist, Russia didn't exist, all the Eastern European markets didn't exist, and so much. Now they all exist, you, you understand. The markets have become incredibly complex. We have a stock market in the U.S. We have international markets developed, like the G7 countries. And then we have the emerging markets, and now they also talk about frontier markets. Then we have the foreign exchange market. There are so many different currencies. They fluctuate. And then we have the commodity markets and the bond markets and so forth. So for someone to be actually 
well informed and for someone to actually take informed decisions, he would have to spend, I mean, minimum three hours a day on uh, reading and analyzing and following the markets. And that, for most people, is not uh, an option. They don't have three hours to spend. They work during the day in a job. And when they go home, they want to maybe go drinking or be visit their girlfriends or their parents or whatnot. And uh, they have other occupations. So three hours a day is a lot of time involvement. So what you need, essentially, as an investor is someone to guide you that uh, analyzes the markets essentially and summarizes it for you and explains you why this is likely to happen and why this is unlikely to happen and so forth. Okay, as we begin to wrap up, Mark, it would be interesting to find out if there are any books you can recommend to our listeners and is there anything else you'd like to discuss with us today? Uh, I'd like to emphasize the following. I have friends, they follow more macroeconomic events, say interest rates movements, stock movements, currency movements, and they have, some of them have done very well by essentially identifying highs and lows in interest rates, highs and lows in currencies and so forth. I have other friends, uh, they are only interested in one thing, analyzing a company. They don't care about the economy. They don't care about the currency. They want to identify uh, in each market or in each country which are the best companies. In some countries, maybe they not not find them because they're not good value. They may be good companies, but not good value. So they have to move on to another country and look, uh, is there in that country compared to the gross opportunity, are they companies that are well run, that have excess cash flow, uh, surplus cash flow, that can deliver growing earnings over the next 10, 15 years, and they invest stock specific. And you asked me before about the contrarian. Is it difficult to find, you know, good value situations nowadays? Well, in 1999, it was obvious that the uh, resource sector, mining companies were very depressed. I think compared to the rest of the market today, we have a similar situation where a lot of value stocks in other words, not the unicorns <laughs> that are supposed to grow and not the fun and the related stocks, but stocks, dodgy companies, they have good value. And so you look around the world, uh, I find some value in emerging markets and I find some value in Europe. And concerning books, you know, you can buy books on uh, the an- analysis of companies, uh, Graham and Dodd and so forth, or you can buy more books that are more general about the economy and about uh, central banking and so forth. I think uh, as an investor, is like Howard Marks, he always says, it doesn't really matter what you buy. What matters is, do you buy it at the high price or you, do you buy it at the low price? And for everything, there is a price. And I think that uh, some, as a beginner in the investment world, I would focus uh, on some books also about technical analysis and about books on economic and stock market cycles and cycles of speculation. I mean, I think... One of the greatest books that is really simple to read for everyone is Manias, Panics and Crashes by Kindleberger. It's really an outstanding book and it's not written by some phony academic in a central bank 
that ordinary people don't understand. It's like if you read a book on medieval history uh, and it's a university professor, he will write for an audience that ordinary people don't understand. Barbara Tuckman, she wrote history books that the public could understand. And so I think it's very important to have a broad exposure to lots of different people who've written and studied economic and financial markets. And I wrote a book once, uh, the Tomorrow's Gold, Asia's Age of Discovery. That was a book that came out in 2002. And there I have a lengthy bibliography. And it's important to, you know, when you go and buy something, you look at different products and you look at different merchants about the price. And so in the investment world, you have to listen to different voices and to different opinions. And over time, maybe you will get be able to form a well-informed opinion yourself, maybe. Okay, thank you very much for your time today, Mark. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?